This is Southern Cross News with Joe Palmer. Good evening, everyone. A 24-year-old Hadspen man has died after losing control of his car and crashing into a tree overnight. The incident occurred near Traveller's Rest on Meander Valley Road. The initial investigation suggesting excessive speed was a contributing factor. A late-night high-speed crash with a fatal end. The Ford Falcon being driven by a 24-year-old Hudsman man left wrapped around a tree. The impact killing the man almost instantly. Early uh, investigations appear that uh, speed was a factor. Um, also, we believe he wasn't wearing a seatbelt at the time and uh, the driver was unlicensed as well. Police arrived at the Meander Valley Road scene near the Traveller's Rest turn-off around 10 o'clock last night. It's understood the driver, who was the only person in the car, was heading towards Launceston. Police say he was travelling at excessive speed when he hit gravel and lost control while attempting to negotiate a slight bend. The car then left the road, struck an embankment and became airborne. It was quite a, uh, a horrific collision where the vehicle actually launched about two and a half metres in the air, uh, went upside down and went in between two trees. The speed limit along this stretch of road is 100 kilometres an hour, but police believe the man may have been driving much faster. Today, crash investigators were back on the scene trying to determine exactly what happened. It's just frustrating for us. It's um, like... Uh, the fatal five and uh, he's contributed with three of those. Online tributes were flowing for the young man, 24-year-old Trent Hill. His family telling Southern Cross, Trent had an awesome sense of humour, was always there to help anyone out in need. He was a beautiful son, brother and uncle who will be sadly missed and was taken too soon. It's a simple message that we're giving is that you need to slow down, you need to drive uh, within the conditions. Um, having a licence is also very, uh, very necessary as well. A report is now being prepared for the coroner. Monika Dadson at Southern Cross News. A scathing report has been tabled in Parliament into the operation of the Glenorchy City Council. Aldermen have already been sacked. Now it recommends a review of management practices after an intense period of division and dysfunction. Clear skies in Glenorchy today, with a cloud lifted over the council. In Parliament, the government tabling the Board of Inquiry report into the council's operation. The report has made a significant number of findings in relation to governance, management and operations of the Glenorchy City Council. In summary, it is scathing and highly critical of the council and key staff. The inquiry examined divisions and dysfunctions related to the majority of aldermen failing to support the mayor. It found they put an apparent intention to destabilise the mayor ahead of community interest and there were a number of potential code of conduct breaches. Also heavily scrutinised in the tabled report, General Manager Peter Brooks, who it said acted unethically and unprofessionally. He refused to comment on the findings. The Local Government Division is currently assessing any possible offences under the Act. Any further action to investigate or refer matters to other bodies on the basis of the Board of Inquiry findings and recommendations will be made in due course. The inquiry found the General Manager and the Mayor are both partly responsible for their relationship breakdown, but Peter Brooks failed to provide support for the Mayor, which reduced her capacity to perform the role. The report is littered with information about how the, the council itself and majority of aldermen have attempted to undermine the office of the mayor. It highlights that I was not treated fair and equitably as mayor during that time. The report recommends a review of management practices and for aldermen to be dismissed. Under special laws, they've already been sacked, with fresh elections to be called in January. The temporary commissioner says improvements are progressing under her watch. We now will dry, draw the line in the sand with that but we will continue what's been going on here since April and that's been having a good look, working out what's wrong with the structure as it was, changing it. It's only just been revealed General Manager Peter Brooks left the council two weeks ago. His position wasn't publicly advertised and has been awarded to Acting General Manager Tony McMullen. The Commissioner is standing by that decision. Why wasn't the General Manager's position publicly advertised? Um, I made a decision on the instability of over two years for the staff in this place. 
Governance experts say the position would usually be advertised. The acting general manager, who has now been uh, appointed for three years, might well be the best person for that job. But the proper way to test that is by advertising the position and giving all candidates the opportunity to apply. The council isn't providing details of Peter Brook's departure, including if he got a payout courtesy of very frustrated ratepayers. Michael Breen, Southern Cross News. State Parliament question time erupted today as debate intensified over allegations of nepotism in the public sector. The Premier relentlessly questioned over why the Head of State Service, Greg Johannes, resigned last week amid concerns over the recruitment of one of the state's highest judges. Parliament today dominated by questions of nepotism. The government grilled over the recent recruitment of a new Supreme Court judge, Gregory Geeson, a close friend and former colleague of the Premier. How do you explain to Tasmanians who are becoming increasingly concerned about the evidence of nepotism on your watch why you ignored the recommendation of the select panel to appoint Philip Jackson SC as Tasmania's next Supreme Court Justice? Will Hodgman strongly rejecting allegations, saying he had withdrawn himself from the recruitment process. I categorically reject the suggestions of uh, the member who makes these claims, trying to What's smear the, the uh, judicial order. process. Uh, which was followed in accordance with the protocol. These claims amid ongoing scrutiny over why the head of the state service, Greg Johannes, resigned last week. Premier, it is clear that you're being dishonest about the circumstances surrounding Mr Johannes' departure. There is no conspiracy theory and worse still, there is no credibility to the dishonest, baseless claims that the Leader of the Opposition continues to make in this place. Cassie O'Connor asserting Will Hodgman threw Mr Johannes under a bus following a recent Auditor General report that outlined concerns of nepotism within the public sector. Following the report's release, the Premier had ordered Mr Johannes to fix the issues and bring in best practice processes. Within 24 hours, he had resigned. Do you accept responsibility for Mr Johannes' resignation the next day and a loss to Tasmania of a public service? servant of the highest integrity. The fact that Mr Johannes himself has said that he left of his own choosing. So for the member to disingenuously come into this place and claim to be his friend when she would so willingly and dishonestly purport the reasons as to why he left is an example, Mr Speaker, of a lack of integrity and honesty. More fire expected in the last two days of Parliament for the year. Louise Hedger, Southern Cross News. Every day Tasmanian medical staff help others, but today four Hobart-based nurses were given their own helping hand, receiving grants through the Florence Nightingale Grants and Awards Program. Presented by the Governor Kate Warner, the awards aim to promote nursing and midwifery education and research. Emma Curtin, Renee Grundy, Claire Morley and Cindy Weatherburn were all recognised. The Outpatient Oncology Nursing Service at the Royal Hobart Hospital also received an award for achievement in nursing practice. A Tasmanian program helping fathers and their children has received a $150,000 lifeline. The DIY Dads program provides temporary accommodation and a stable environment for fathers and their children. Jamie and his son Ryder enjoy the play equipment at their unit complex. Go! They're one of several families living here as part of the DIY Dads Two. program. There's a workshop, there's a playground, there's a playroom. <laughs> Um, and the garden as well. And the idea is to try and help dads and the kids to be active and to get involved in just particular activities. They can even do cooking. There are eight self-contained two-bedroom units for men with full or part-time care of their children and in need of stable accommodation. The programs for fathers who have not been able to have their children live with them because they've not had appropriate accommodation. Father of two, Jack Pullen, says it's been vital. I love being a father and you know, my son's in my life, so without my son's in my life, you know, my life isn't, it doesn't really have much meaning, so. Bob Walker coordinates the program and helps with the transition into more permanent accommodation. It's very high rents. Uh, the blokes that come in are obviously not able to afford it. 
uh, connect them up with Housing Connect and that's a valuable support um, and also Housing Taz uh, trying to move through that. The Motors Foundation has provided $150,000 to keep the program running for the next three years. Up until now, Hobart City Mission had been funding the program itself. Which was going to be a challenge to, to continue to do, so our ability to fundraise and find a significant donor like Motors Foundation is critical. Michael Breen, Southern Cross News. Some of Tasmania's best young swimmers have battled it out in Hobart today for the annual Champions Carnival. Around 500 students from 58 different primary schools took to the water at the Doon Kennedy Aquatic Centre after being selected from their divisional carnivals earlier in the month. Several students will now go on to compete at the Pacific School Games. Cladding on the Launceston General Hospital's main building has been found to be non-compliant with the National Construction Code. The Director of Building Control made the preliminary finding following a recent audit of the site. Health Minister Michael Ferguson says the cladding poses no immediate safety risk to the public and he's making it his priority to place, replace it with appropriate material. Three Tasmanians have plunged into one of the country's most challenging classrooms. The students delivered services typically found in a hospital to people living hundreds of kilometres from their nearest town. This trio is back home after a whirlwind trip, testing their medical skills on a sunburnt landscape. Bush Hospitality working with the Royal Flying Doctor Service in the country's most remote locations. I did love the flying. <laughs> Sharon Fitzpatrick spent two weeks based out of Broken Hill, covering an enormous patch across western New South Wales. Flight hopping between jobs was all in a day's work. Up there there's like a three, four hour, five hour drive for some of them to get an x-ray, so it really brought home the fact that they are very remote and that really has a big impact on how you look after them from a medical perspective. The environment was wildly different, but the students agree it was excellent preparation for working in a local hospital. Kirsty Bennett spent two weeks as a fly-in, fly-out nurse in Port Augusta. Her workspace was often on board the plane, gliding high above the ground. The planes are quite small, so there's not a, lo not a lot of room to work in. So it's, I mean, the nurses already do an incredible job, um, and so to do it under those circumstances is even more amazing. Nothing they did was taken for granted. A lot of them had been waiting in pain or had lack of confidence because of their teeth. So it was nice to go in and change some of that for them. They get a, a real first-hand flavour of what we do and, and a different part of medicine and nursing and dental work. Tom Johnson, Southern Cross News. Now let's take a look at the day's business and finance news with thanks to TASPLAN, your local super fund. The share market has closed slightly lower amid weakness among the heavyweight banking, mining and telco stocks. The ASX 200 index has dropped by 4.5 points. A short time ago, the Australian dollar was trading at 76.1 US cents and 109.7 New Zealand cents. Tasmanian Brody Mychek has spent his first day in Collingwood colours after being picked up by the club in yesterday's AFL rookie draft. The 25-year-old, who hails from Burnie, helped guide Port Melbourne to a premiership in the VFL this season. After being overlooked in previous years, Mychek says it feels incredible to get the call up. Saw the name pop up and a couple minutes after that, the phone calls rolled in and messages and... Yeah, it was all pretty full on from there and by the time I went to bed around 10 o'clock, I've been on my phone for five hours. My check wrapped up at least 17 disposals 10 times this year. He comes from a footballing family with Father Jack playing three seasons with Essendon in the late 1970s. Football Federation Tasmania is asking all sides of government to dig deep into their pockets to grow the sport in the state. The organisation unveiled its five-year plan today but needs millions in fundings to make it a reality. With the state election fast approaching, what better time to put in a $6 million wish list at a carefully chosen location? We're here at Mount Carmel and you can see these kids doing a skills acquisition program behind us and they're on a tennis court. 
So that's that's a good example of the issue that we've got. Following a year-long consultation process that included feedback from each club around the state, the organisation's five-year plan is based heavily around infrastructure, namely $1.5 million for pitch and change room upgrades at KG5 and a potential all-new $1.25 million playing facility at Churchill Park in the state's north. We're not actually asking for that much when you compare it with the money that's been poured into some of the other sports. If you've got an A-League team here, then you need the next level of infrastructure down. You need really strong NPL games, you need to be able to play other NPL teams from other states. With the number of registered players around the state expected to grow from 12,000 to 20,000 by 2023, no club will miss out under the plan, with $3 million requested for lighting upgrades to Beachside, Somerset and Ulverston, and club room upgrades for Devonport, Launceston City and Kingborough, just to name a few. It's about grassroots participation, as well as support for the clubs that really have been struggling with the standard of facilities that they've got. The state government and Labor today claiming it will give the proposal careful consideration leading up to the election. Good evening. Hobart 20 today. Launceston again the warmest around the state with 28 degrees. Burnie and Devonport 22. Mostly clear and sunny apart from some early cover over the east and southeast. Cressy 26 degrees. Strawn, Ooze and Scottsdale 25. Flinders Island 24 today. Campania 23. Lowhead, Wynyard, Friendly Beaches and King Island all 22 degrees. Low level cloud is over our east as mentioned and the mainland due to onshore winds. Extensive cloud, a middle level cloud that is over parts of Queensland and New South Wales. Convective cloud with thunderstorms near the WA South Australia border. There's the close up and there's the status today with just that whip of cloud over the east and southeast. Tomorrow a northerly flow develops over the state ahead of the next cold front. A trough extends north from this over WA. Another trough is inland over New South Wales and Queensland. Winds east to northeast increasing to 30 knots over the northwest and to 20 knots elsewhere with light winds inland. Strong wind warning is on. That's for waters between Sandy Cape and Stanley. A mostly sunny 28 degrees for Hobart tomorrow, hitting 30 for Jeeveston, a hot day after early fog, and 31 for Bothwell. Launceston, fine, sunny, 29. 21 for Devonport, mostly sunny, a sunny day for Cressy, and 28 degrees. Burnie, mostly sunny, and 21, up to 30 for Strawn, 22 for Curry, and partly cloudy. St Helens, partly cloudy, and 23, up to 25 for Swansea, Orford, cloud clearing, and 24 degrees. There's the UV for tomorrow, pushing into the extreme range for all except Hobart. On Thursday, we should feel the hottest day this week, with a possible shower increasing over the west. Rain in the west and south for the first day of summer, extending throughout by the afternoon. And for Saturday, rain contracting to the northeast and easing to showers, isolated showers for the rest of the state. Further north tomorrow, and partly cloudy in 23 in Perth, 14 degrees warmer than that in Adelaide, sunny and warm in Melbourne, a possible shower in Sydney, and a shower in Brisbane. Mostly clear in 18 in Hobart, 23 degrees right now in Launceston, Devonport clear in 19 degrees. This sort of weather, Joe, takes me back to childhood when you put the sprinkler on in the back lawn and run around all afternoon. That was a lot of fun, wasn't it? Yes, it was a lot of fun. Was lots of fun indeed. Lots of embarrassing photos from moments like that, aren't there? Thanks, Murph. That's all from the team for now. Have a great evening. Enjoy the warmth. We'll see you a bit later. Bye-bye.